show people that we are under his control. It's not obvious because we're all going to die. Dying shows that, wait a minute, doesn't that show that we're not under the Spirit? And doesn't our sin show that we're not under the Spirit? And Paul says that's not true. We have resurrection life, and God is working in our life to make us less sinful than we have been in the past. Paul says that even with Christ in us, our bodies are still dead because of sin. Just because we have the Spirit, just because we have resurrection life, does not mean that we're not going to die, because we still have the same old body. Physical death is the penalty for sin, and it's going to be carried out unless the Lord returns on October 21st. <laughs> I don't know, I'm still hoping, <laughs> but I doubt it. He says, your spirit is alive because of the righteousness that God has given to us. We are going to go to heaven because of God's righteousness. It doesn't depend on our death. It doesn't, isn't, isn't nullified by our death, and it doesn't depend on whether we are sinless. It depends on God's life and his righteousness in that life. But he still says we have an obligation. We still have to obey. The spirit of life sets us free from the condemnation, but it does not set us free from following after God and trying to please him. And because the spirit of, is of life, we are assured that we're going to have eternal life and a resurrected body. But God's gift me, still means that we have to follow after him. We are reproducing the life that he has given us. It's, we're growing that life. We're making it come out. We are still here. We're going to follow after Jesus Christ. We're going to use the spirit. And only if we use the spirit are we going to put to death our old nature. So Paul tells us, that we have to put to death the misdeeds of the body. We have to kill those temptations and that, those choices to sin. And he says we have to continue to live according, he says continuing to live according to the flesh means that the spirit is not in us. So he's saying one thing, saying live by the spirit, you'll become more like God. Live by the flesh, it's going to come out in your life in sin. Paul is serious about the need to put, for us to put into effect the life that God gives to us. Uh, he says we have to do this. But he also says that the Spirit is going to help us. You know, yeah, we're not going to be great, uh, perfect people, but the Spirit is going to come along and give us the power to follow after him. Paul never suggests that the inheritance of the Christian life is going to, it, it, the requirement of that is to stop sinning. He says, yes, you are going to sin, I know you're going to sin, but you still have eternal life. There is no condemnation. His bottom line is to tell us that we are loved by God. What he demands, though, is a clear, long-term progress. I have one friend who says it's not perfection that God requires, it's direction. doesn't matter how good you are right now. What matters is, are you progressing in your Christian life? Are you moving towards God-likeness? You're never going to become God, but we want to become less sinners. We want to become better people, more like God. And it's the direction that we're heading. It's not the perfection that is our goal. In applying these verses, first thing I, th I thought we should talk about a little bit is the Trinity. Uh, the church has always used a, a triangle kind of object to, to portray the Trinity. The Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible, per se, as a word, but it is there as a doctrine. And in this chapter, there are several indications about the Trinity. Paul involves the Father and the Son and the Spirit in the work of redemption. He says that God has sent Jesus into the world uh, to condemn sin and that the Holy Spirit applies that to our life. The Trinity is involved in your salvation, is involved in bringing you into the presence of God. All three persons of the Trinity. And he varies the way he talks about God's work in our hearts in verses 9 and 10. He does so very interestingly. He starts off by saying that um, we have the sinful nature, but we live by the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit. And then he moves on to the Spirit of God. Then he says it's the Spirit of Christ, and he ends up by saying it's just Jesus himself. He can use these words sometimes interchangeably in the process of our salvation. He talks about God, he talks about the Spirit, he talks about Jesus. Yes, they all have different jobs, they all have different personality, but they are all involved 
in our salvation. And one God is saving us. The second thing I think we need to talk about is this importance of mindset, which we've been dwelling on all morning. He has said we have to have our minds set on the things of the Spirit. We have to start dwelling on them, focusing on them. This just doesn't include thinking. It also includes all the choices that we make. We have to start thinking God's thoughts. We have to start choosing what God would choose. And we have to do so more and more every day, training our minds. Having the mindset of the Spirit is this middle step. God has placed us in the Spirit, okay? But then we have to live according to the Spirit. We are in the sphere of the Spirit, spirit, but we have to walk according to the Spirit as well. And having our mindset on Jesus Christ connects those two. How do you go from being in the Spirit to walking in the Spirit is training our mind, making better choices, following after God. It's that mindset that we have. Cultivating a Spirit-filled, Spirit-led disposition is necessary if we're going to follow after God. How are you, how, so the question is, how are we forming our mind? What are we putting in them? What are we exposing them to? You know, are the movies that we are watching, do they tell us how to behave? You know, that's what uh, those two guys at Columbine did. They watched The Matrix and said, hey, the world does not exist. I should wear a big black coat and shoot people and then shoot myself, and it won't matter because I'm just a a battery living in some made-up world. It informed their world and ended up with horrible results. What are the movies that you're watching doing to you? What are the TV shows and the advertisements that you're doing? What are the books that you're reading? How are they informing your mind? Are they helping you become more like Jesus Christ? How about the ads that you read? And it's everywhere. Ads that you read, ads that you watch, ads that you listen to. It's everywhere. a couple weeks ago, I, I got a phone call from a, from a, a church. Uh, they wanted me to buy their DVD set, uh, which would help our church become a great, fantastic, beautiful church. Um, I, I already got a great, fantastic, beautiful church. Uh, leave me alone. Uh, they started off this conversation by saying that George Barna, who, who does research about Christians in the United States and around the world, said George Barna has said that, that Christians in America are way too uh, influenced by materialism, and by consumerism. And then they wanted me to buy this DVD set. (laughs) It gets better. At the end, at the end, they said, we will send this DVD set to you uh, for 30 days. You don't have to pay. All you do, if you don't want it, just send it back to us, and there's no no charge. And they said, now, would you like to buy this? Would you like us to send this to you? And I said, no. And they said, well, why not? I said, because you are trying to manipulate me with the world's means by sending me this thing because you know that if I have it in my hot little hands, I'll want to keep it. And that is flat manipulation the way the world works, and I don't like being manipulated. Well, you know, we just have to do it that way. I said, the second thing I don't like about you, (laughs) he asked, (laughs) the second thing I don't like here is that you're assuming that success is the same, success in the church is the same thing as success in the world. You're saying if I don't have a huge church, if I don't have thousands of people coming to see, to see me on Sunday morning, if we don't have a huge ministry here, that we're a failure as a church. And I said, you have bought into the consumerism of this world, just like you introduced your sales pitch with. And he's going, well, we have got lots of small town churches who come to see our seminars. I said, do you have any small town pastors teaching at your seminars? Well, no, they're all big successful guys. Okay. We are way too much influenced by this world and we need to correct that by becoming, um, seeking what God has for us. Spiritual food, not just on Sunday morning, but in your personal devotions, your reading of the Bible, your understanding what is in Bible studies, in Sunday school, we need to do this all the time. Now, you can't spend all of your time reading the Word and praying. Okay? God does not ask us to do that. He says you need to take care of your family, you need to pay your bills, you need to, to, to work, you need to interact with your friends. There's lots of things God asks us to do. 
But every day we need